What's up, Lions of Liberty fans? You can now support this show on Patreon and get exclusive access to bonus audio and video content, including Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests, and so much more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. Hey, 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 what do you say, everybody? Welcome to Electric Liberty Land number 108. Yes, big 108, the exact weight that I like all of my paramours to be at. No, 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 that sounds like fat shaming. We can't start off that way, can we? Uh, How about uh, ELL 108? 108, the number of inches that I like in my sharks whenever I'm attacked. There you go. Everybody can get behind a good shark attack, right? And by the way, guys, fun fact for you. 95% 95% of shark attacks are because you're ugly. Scientists don't like to tell you that, but you can't hide the truth just like you can't hide that ugly mug. So anyway, welcome to the show, guys. Of course, you can find all the show notes for today's program over at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL108. All the nice links for the uh, topics I'm be talking about today. And first topic, actually, you know, it's like, I had to talk about this, and I, I didn't get a chance last week, so there's just too many other things going on. And, of course, this show is going to be centered on, uh, as you might have surmised by the title, America's Culture War. And I said versus, just to, to keep it short, but versus Venezuela's actual civil war, which seems to be percolating. And Mike Pence today, or actually uh, yesterday, when you're listening to this, had issued a statement strongly supporting the overthrowing of Venezuela's government and declaring that the true president was not, in fact, Maduro, but actually the leader of the opposition party. You know, strong rhetoric from the uh, vice president of the United States. So we'll talk about that because it's just fascinating what's going on right now in regards to these MAGA kids, you know, a smirking white kid versus a completely ridiculous uh, political activist, old Indian man, who uh, the media instantly jumped to defend and to condemn these MAGA kids. But it's interesting seeing the juxtaposition of the media covering that and how it dominated everything full stop. Meanwhile, Venezuela this past weekend, or I'd say not being this week, this past few days, had a literal coup attempted between the National Guard going calls for there to be an actual armed revolution within the country from the opposition as well as backing from other nations in the region. As I said, we'll get to that because uh, that was a story that nobody felt like covering because there was just too much bullshit to cover and misrepresentation of facts to get into. But anyway, like I said, before we do that, though, I have to talk about uh, Sweden and Sweden has some incredibly strict hate speech laws. We're seeing a lot of this happen, especially throughout Europe. UK, as we know, has very strong hate speech laws and very strong uh, online rhetoric laws, wherein they literally will come to your house. If you post some sort of threat, some sort of uh, of insult, something that's negative about immigrants or about a, a race, they will actually come to your house and arrest you. I mean, we saw in Scotland the famous case of the man who taught his dog to give a sigheil and was arrested. And they I, actually, I think he didn't actually go to prison. He was sentenced to go to prison. And I think he escaped that charge. But it was one of the most absurd things you could ever hope to see in your life. I mean, it was funny. It's a dog. Do that's his girlfriend's dog that, that this guy trains to give a Nazi symbol just to apology. fuck with her. Not to fuck with the Jews, not to fuck with any other races or minorities, but to fuck specifically with his girlfriend, who will be shocked and appalled when she sees that her cute, adorable little dog now gives Zig Hales whenever somebody gives it a command. That is very funny. I respect him. It's inoffensive. Sure, it's offensive. But much in the comedy world is, in fact, offensive. Anyway. Sweden's the latest one we have to get into in this. And there's, so Sweden's got any sort of, uh, I guess, 
speech that is against migrants or is against the concept of migrants being to come into the country. And we're seeing demographic changes. We're seeing Sweden's uh, rape rates go up like 33%. The crime rates go up 33% from this mass influx. I mean, especially when you look at a country like Sweden, which has been pretty much, uh, <laughs> I don't know, one variety of people. It's probably the easiest and most politically correct way to put it for uh, as long as it has Something clearly has changed, and it's changed within the last few years as these immigrants have come in. And we're not laboring all immigrants as evil people, rapists, etc., in, in a Donald Trumpian way. But you can't ignore statistics. And the PC left tends to want to ignore the basic facts and statistics that come out in situations like this and saying that, oh, well, these are just poor people that need a home and these are blown out. This, this shit ain't blown out of proportion. These are cold, hard facts. Anyway. One of the uh, websites that I read fairly often is, in fact, Zero Hedge, despite the fact that they have some of the worst advertising I've ever seen constantly popping up in my face and breaking up stories and also crashing my browser more often than not. However, they have a story which they have republished from an author named Emma R. uh, via the VOE website. And it's talking about a hate speech monitoring group called (laughs) Nath... It's never going to say this right. I should have asked my boy Chris Osborne to pronounce it. He's over there in uh, in the region of the world in which this is taking place. Nathats Grandskarin? Eh, let's go with that. Nathats Grandskarin, uh, run by a man named Tomas Aberg, which receives tax funds for mass reporting pensioners and others who write critically about migration on Facebook. And of course, they're saying pensioners because we're talking about people that are tending to be more in the elder side of things in Sweden, people that are already retired, getting their pensions, who might have a different different mindset than the next generation, which has now been, of course, brainwashed into believing that all things involving the uh, multinationalism and multiculturalism must immediately be accepted as gospel rather than looking at the actual consequences that forced migration and things of this nature might have upon a uh, culture, which is, until this point, as I said, pretty homogenous. So what they are, they're claiming, this is Thomas Aberg's, or Thomas Aberg's institution, they're claiming that they had 1,218 police reports between 2017 and 2018, 144 hate speech sentences from 214 notifications. And I suppose these notifications are the posts on Facebook. With many more waiting for prosecution. And not that's Grinskarin translates to the online hate speech monitor, by the way. This is off their Twitter feed. They're also saying that state financed operations have also led to a tenfold increase in the number of hate speech convictions in Sweden. This is reported by another person. So what we're seeing now is you've got online groups that are actively trying to report instances that people post on social media where they question the efficacy of this mass migration or immigration, where they're questioning the effect it's having on Sweden's economy, on its uh, women, (laughs) Uh, as I said, with like a 33% increase in rapes over the past decade. And uh, I was reading additional stats on that, that the vast majority of those are in fact foreign born. And of course, just on the basic culture. You know, when you have a small country like Sweden and you introduce a mass influx of a different culture that is completely uninitiated, uh, unacculturated, and is making little effort to actually assimilate itself, or, or even not even that, I would argue that even trying to assimilate within a short period of time when you have a mass influx of people like that into a country is going to be incredibly difficult. So these people go on social media to vent their frustrations, presumably in Swedish with a strong accent. I don't know if the bikini team's involved with it or not. We could all fantasize about that. You know, maybe that's the only time hate speech is okay. You know, people putting people in prison if they happen to arrest two of the Swedish bikini girls, put them in a prison cell together and just let them fight it out, you know? But anyway, the point being... This is kind of the ultimate fear that I have when we talk about hate speech as a whole and government being involved in what is or what is not hate speech, because you see how easily this gets extended into encompassing almost any speech that's critical of a government standard. And what we're seeing here is a very PC standard. Of course, Sweden's a very, very uh, left-leaning country as far as the politics, as far as the, the cultural understandings of, of things, it tends to be very left-leaning. However, like I'm saying, you get the government involved in this. Now you have a amorphous term like hate speech, 
which can encompass virtually anything. And when the government has the ability to dictate the terms of what that is or is not, it can now say that anything that is critical of a government program is hate speech. You know, I said this in the past when I'm making the point about slavery in the United States, where if you had a government that had control over hate speech legislation, as governments do now, they could very easily say, well, you are now using hate speech because you're criticizing the government. You're criticizing white people who are using slaves. I mean, these people are simply white people who are criticizing bringing in immigrants to the country. Now, we're just talking about two different standards and two different times. However, as we see, times change, and the government 100% thought that it was in the right that slaves were property and not people at that former time, a darker time in our history, no pun intended. And you don't think they would have gladly used this kind of speech to, to put people in jail, which they already did, by the way. There were, they were journalists jailed. There were all sorts of things that already went on to try to silence the abolitionists at the time. But if you had this explicit power put into law where you can dictate anything hate speech and then prosecute people because of it and put them in jail— how easily is this abused? And you're seeing it right here to quash free speech because there's no such thing as hate speech. It's simply free speech, all of it. And the relevance of the phrase hate speech becomes more and more powerful the more we see governments get involved in what it is. I mean, just like during the Red Scare when the phrase communist was thrown around as a way to uh, attack one's enemies, label them a communist, associate their name with the Red Scare, and that person was easily prosecuted, thrown into jail, without often without even trial, but was put into this political blacklist, was removed from society as a danger to the government. We saw what happened with that. Hate speech is the new Red Scare when it comes to free speech and when it comes to a weapon that can be welded as a massive cudgel against anyone with whom the government or these PC fuckballs disagree with. And it is absolutely terrifying. Sweden is a good example of it coming right now. And there, but for the grace of God, go we people. Another topic I want to get into in regards to government overreach and the impact on everyday citizens in regards to government getting involved with things that it should not be involved with regards the uh, healthcare industry. You'll remember a few years ago, the government insisted that every single doctor across these United States made sure that they could no longer use a paper system for their filing and for their record keeping within their doctor's office, within their hospital, etc. And many, many Smaller doctors or you know, smaller offices use these paper systems in which to keep track of patients' files. If you had to change your doctor, you simply said, hey, fax my files over to my new doctor. Bingo, bango, taken care of. But what we saw was the healthcare industry being forced to adopt this digital platform by government. They said, we have to standardize it across everything for more accurate record keeping is what they told us. It would cut down on time. It'll cut down on patient expense is what they told us. Of course, that's all proven to be complete fucking bullshit. What's actually happened is that now we've got a international, or not international, we've got a national database of healthcare records, which the government at this point pretends they don't have access to. I would be shocked if that were the case. And you'll remember President Obama, during his threats against the Second Amendment, where he wanted to make all these executive orders attacking Second Amendment rights, brought up an emphasis on mental health and how he wanted to tie gun ownership in with mental health and psychiatric evaluations, being able to look at your health records, etc. Now, talk about a horrific concept is allowing the government to, number one, look at all your health records, and number two, base whether or not you should be able to own a firearm, one of your when you're a Second Amendment right, or your Second Amendment right, but being able to own a firearm, being tied to your mental health. Because then we get into this question, just like with the hate speech issue. This is why they're tied together, people. This is why I'm a professional. But this is why having the government be able to define any sort of terms in this way becomes a very slippery slope with very nefarious outcomes. We're seeing it happen with hate speech. We're seeing the definition of hate speech, which cannot really be defined anyway, be expanded and expanded and expanded so it throws a wider and wider net against malcontents that have an issue with the government or its policies. When we see this happen with healthcare, as Obama wanted, we give the government access to our mental health records. Now the government gets to define who or, is not, who or who is not mentally competent to own a firearm. Well, it seems to me that it would be very, very easy for them to then say, 
well, why don't we just look at all the people that are complaining about government, just like Sweden does with hate speech. Why don't we look at all these people complaining about the government, complaining about their liberties, saying that we're doing a bad job, saying that they want more liberty, saying that the government is overreaching into their personal lives. Why don't we then just say that those people have anger issues or are mentally unstable and we'll take away their guns? And that is exactly what Obama wanted to do. So when I see this digitization of healthcare records, immediately my brain goes to, oh, this is just the government trying to make it far easier for them to get access to us and thus control us, which is exactly what it is. Now, again, the lie that was told at the beginning of this was that it would make things cheaper and easier. What's actually happened is that it might be somewhat simpler for you to be able to go to one hospital or another and have your, your records uh, you know, pop up in a computer database. Lovely. However, the downside of this is that because of government regulations, everything takes doctors far longer than originally, even longer than if they had to flip through a file looking at, you know, papers and whatever else. I remember my doctor, did he pick up a file? He'd flip a couple pages. That's all he needed to do. But now, once the appointment's over and and even before the appointment's begun, you have doctors who now have to sit down. They have to memorize codes for different varieties of diseases and ailments and procedures and all this other shit that the government has mandated be used across the board. They have to spend time typing up very detailed uh, descriptions of everything that's going on, making sure to categorize them correctly. Otherwise, they have to go back and do it all again. And what we're seeing because of this is that doctors have a far lower satisfaction rate with dealing with their patients because they can't see as many patients in a day because they're bogged down doing what they say. There's, I guess, the average response. And they said it's about 45 minutes that they have to spend or that one if they have spent in conjunction with some of the nurses per patient, just inputting data into this government regulated database. So the New York Post has this story where they are talking about a recent study. 44% of doctors said they've considered leaving the field. 35% said they find themselves getting exasperated with their patients more. 14% they said they make errors they usually wouldn't make. And many doctors said that they actually dread coming to work now. One, one woman doctor even said that she's been having miscarriages because of the amount of stress uh, and, and difficulty that she now has at work. And they just feel like they're wasting their time. You know, they, these people went to school for, you know, 8, 12 years. And now, instead of being able to service the patients that they have, be able to have FaceTime, interaction. They're now spending all their time looking at a computer because the government said it must be so. And by the way, God forbid that you don't keep your records up to date to this digital database. Well, you get fined out of existence. You could even be possibly sent to jail if you continue to ignore the mandates from the government. Very cut and dried example of how government regulations involved with the healthcare industry are making lives worse for everybody, starting with the doctors, ending with the patients. You don't even have to get into the insurance and cronyism. Look at this. It's just that easy. So next time you have a debate with somebody about healthcare, make sure to point out this little factoid about how we might not have any doctors left by the time this country actually gets around to going socialist. All right, let's take a quick break as I collect my thoughts to go into the next segment, and I'll be right back with you. We don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. Those epic words from Archilochus can sum up your ability to succeed or fail in business. I want to recommend Conversation Mat Time to our listeners as a way to hone your one-on-one conversation skills in a role-playing session that can help take you to the next level. During 25-minute sessions, you'll work through the best way to approach that raise, that interview, or that relationship with a practice professional that will provide the confidence and experience you need to get paid what you're worth or take that interpersonal risk you've never been able to conquer. Just like in jiu-jitsu, the difference between a novice and a black belt is mat time train to win. Visit conversationmattime.com and take advantage of a free 15-minute consultation just for listeners of this show. All right, welcome back to Electric Liberty Land, episode number 108. Yes, come hither with me into this den of liberty I've dug out, spent a lot of time hibernating in, probably a little rank in here. Anyway, guys, there's a brand new idiot on the Financial Services Committee. Yes, yes, the powerful Financial Services Committee, which oversees much of the financial regulation that impacts our banking systems, our investors, uh, everything else that happens to go along with that. A lot of Wall Street influence, I would imagine. And I say newest idiot because there's already one huge idiot sitting on it, which is, of course, Maxine Waters, one of the daftest people in all of government 
happens to sit on the Financial Services Committee herself. And now we've added a brand new socialist in the incarnation of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has been named to the Financial Services Committee, despite the fact that she's only been in Congress for roughly two months. And despite having an economics degree from Boston College, which... Man, Boston College must be absolutely embarrassed that that half-tard is running around out there touting her economic knowledge while getting $21 trillion errors wrong in her healthcare proposals and throwing things out like the new green or the green new deal, which cannot possibly be feasible in any sense of the word. I mean, the new green deal is calling for completely getting off of all fossil fuels and transitioning to a uh, renewable economy as far as energy goes and trying to do that, what, in the next 10 years? Uh, and, and, and don't forget, also, we'll address racial and uh, income inequalities because that makes total sense. By destroying the lowest cost energy systems that we have, that's going to somehow help the poor and guarantee that there's going to be more jobs rather than just bankrupting us as a nation, which is what would immediately happen. But anyway, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, now on the Financial Services Committee, guys. So this should be exciting. I mean, in truth, I ain't even mad. I think, if anything, it's good to give this woman more ability to showcase just how wrong she is and just how often she is wrong. Also give her a platform to issue statements like being a billionaire is immoral. Really, if being a billionaire is immoral, then isn't our government the most immoral thing in existence? Because that's just stealing trillions of dollars a year from people running a budget, which is trillions and trillions of dollars beyond what we even have as, as a, a, an entity, as a collective Borg-like entity. You know, billionaires at least don't run deficits that are 17 times what they have in the bank. At least they did something to earn that money rather than just taking it from other people, stealing it away from other innocents uh, who are just trying to make a living. But, you know, according to AOC, the billionaires are the immoral ones. And having a society that would enable billionaires is immoral. What an idiot. And in regards to that, I just I had to talk a little bit about this this story because— Alexandria, or AOC, was just at some sort of panel speaking event and said that climate change was her generation's World War II. Insinuating, of course, that climate change is going to wipe out, you know, something like a third of the world's population. and uh, But then have a really great bounce back, I suppose. Even though that's a myth. The whole economic bounce back after war is a complete and total myth. But anyway, saying that World War II uh, or climate change is her generation's World War II. And the best part is that it's all going to happen in 12 years. Yes, the world's going to end in 12 years, according to AOC, who I didn't realize she had any Aztec in her background, but maybe there's some in here because she's thrown out a calendar, which I ain't seen yet, baby, but it's got to be carved in stone as hard as that girl's butt. Anyway, it inspired a brand new TV show, which I didn't even know she was working on, but which I had a little uh, snippet that I pulled and I want to share with you guys now. Now, it's not completed, I don't think. It seems to be missing some background music, but I think this is going to air on MSNBC. And the tentative title I heard was based, it's, it's based around Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's amazing mind powers and ability to tap into that next dimension that we're, we're so close to, to, to travel with her brain power only into the near future and see what's forthcoming. Told it's going to be called Millennial Medium. And here's what I was leaked from an uh, inside source. Millennial medium. She could see the future, but she's really dumb. A senator who still sucks her thumb. Waiting for socialism's guns to come. She could see the future, but she makes mistakes. 21 trillion healthcare, slam on the brakes. Millennial medium. She is no Kreskin, but she's got a nice bum. Teeth like a gopher, that's her crystal ball. To see the future and predict the fall of man. (laughs) I don't have time to put music behind that. You get the idea. I'll leave it up to Dan Spots. If you're listening to this, Dan Spots, got another task for you. I'll give you free promotion if you put some music behind it, doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just <laughs> something to round it out. Dan Smots, of course, of the System is Down podcast, which uh, I just heard. 
Gave us a nice little name drop when he had Johnny Rocket Adams in there from Blast Off. Uh, of course, Johnny's been doing that show. It used to be the uh, the launch pad. Now it's Blast Off. But they had him in there talking about IPAs and Liberty and uh, defending IPAs, which, of course, are uh, just hog piss garbage. I'll never change my mind on it. But anyway, I, I just I don't understand how we continue to to let this woman go and make such idiotic statements. And nobody is like, why did we vote for her again? Like we're talking about impeaching Trump over this ridiculous Buzzfeed story, which I haven't talked about yet. I'll just address that briefly because really until any evidence comes out about it, it's kind of a moot point, but we have Trump being accused people saying we're going to impeach him because of this Buzzfeed story, which accuses him of telling Michael Cohen, you know, a known liar. (laughs) It's, but using Michael Cohen uh, of of lying to Congress about the date in which this Trump Tower negotiations happened with Russia and Trump saying, ah, oh, we'll just, you know, move it back a couple months. And they're saying that there's supposedly some evidence of this happening. Meanwhile, I mean, I, I unless Trump sent it in an email, which we know he does an email. I don't even know if Trump texted back in the day, but I don't I don't see how you're going to prove that this happened. You know, Michael Cohen's word is not evidence of it happening. And I think Michael Cohen at this point will say just about anything he needs to say to try to get a plea deal down. But for BuzzFeed to go out there and release this story, which says <laughs> that two of the reporters talked to somebody who had evidence, so they claim, of this, this allegation being true. And of course, they didn't they themselves didn't see the actual proof. They didn't see any documents. They were just told that this was true. And somehow this is some a story that BuzzFeed feels has to be verified. Then you have Mueller coming out and specifically saying. This is patently untrue. BuzzFeed still stands by the story. But anyway, this idiotic BuzzFeed story comes out. Mass media coverage. Everybody says the word impeach. I was reading some, uh, you know, Real Clear Politics, I think, article about it, breaking down the number of times impeach was said on network news. And it was like some, you know, 100 plus times during the 24-hour coverage, despite the fact that there's zero evidence. Despite the fact that there's not only zero evidence, but there's zero evidence. secondary sources from any other media outlet that can even back it up. And this is the problem with today's media too. And, and it's segue, this is going to segue perfectly into the, the MAGA kids. But there's one source that releases a tidbit of information and every other media outlet jumps on this shit like it's just pigs at the trough, man. Can't get enough. Shove your mouths full of it. Report it as nauseum. Add your own bullshit spin to it to make pretend that you have something interesting to say or you had any relevance to this story. But God forbid you do any sort of follow-up. God forbid you do any real journalism and actually try to get confirmation on the story before you just report it, retweet it, uh, link to it on your homepage. I mean, how many times it Fox covered it, MSNBC, CNN, uh, every single news channel was all over this, this goddamn report, which still has not been proven to be true and which Mueller distinctly reported as uncategorically false. So instead of having that Blow up. Instead of talking about impeaching Trump, where is the impeachment talk for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? I mean, going out there, throwing out completely fabricated numbers. We're talking about, they're talking about Donald Trump lying. Is it worse to lie or to be so stupid that you lie by accident because you literally have no clue what you're talking about? But in the meantime, we'll just go ahead and put this woman on one of the most powerful oversight committees that we have as a government. Where's the impeachment talk? When can we roll this turd back into the poop chute? So aggravating. Anyway, all right, moving on. Uh, I do want to talk about this this MAGA thing, and uh, I'll probably just finish it up on that. I've had a uh, I've had a rough day. So, what we all saw roll out here was MAGA hat wearing kids from Covenant Catholic University. Go to take part in the March for Life, March for Life, not March for Our Lives. That was the gun control one. March for Life. And they end up going to the Lincoln Memorial, standing there with their hats off, or hats on, pardon me, waiting for the bus to come and pick them up. And I remember myself, when I went on a field trip to Washington, D.C., when I was a young buck in high school, as these kids are, didn't go for the March for Life, mind you, but just went to do a Washington, D.C. tour. You go around, you see monuments, you go to Chinatown. At those days, you had to go to Chinatown to buy some sweet uh, porno because they would deal it to you. Didn't have the internet on my damn phone. 
But anyway, we did meet up at the Lincoln Memorial, and that's where we got picked up. Because it's a convenient meetup spot, convenient access for buses, etc. So these kids are out there, standing around, and getting yelled at by black Israelites, who uh, are completely batshit insane racists, without a doubt, and are calling these kids all sorts of racial epithets. They're telling them that they're pedophile faggots. They're t- saying all sorts of horrible things to these kids. And the kids, of course, are number one going to be intimidated because it's a bunch of younger teens. And of course, these guys would not be yelling this shit at a, a grown group of men. We all know that. So these guys are taking advantage of the fact that these are young kids they to scream at them and just be horrible individuals. I mean, you know, we talk about ways to turn people racist. That's one way to turn people racist. If you're a militant black organization yelling at a bunch of white kids and calling them uh, pedophile faggots and crackers, uh, that's probably not going to win you any fans. But anyway, not to, not to the point yet. So they're yelling horrible things at these kids. Yet no violence breaks out. The kids are standing where they're at. They're kind of doing some school cheers, which I heard were labeled as saying, build the wall. Uh, I did some research into this myself and watched the video. The school mascot is the col- the colonels. So they said, go calls. And you can hear the kids going, calls, 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 like that. It's clearly a school cheer. No no wall building. So in the midst of them doing these cheers to try to drown out these, these black dudes that are screaming at them, comes this asshole named Nathan Phillips, who is a renowned activist who has gotten in trouble for misleading media and lying about an altercation previously that happened in Michigan and has a penchant for doing these kind of media-friendly stunts that are then taken out of context. So this old uh, Indian dude walks up, Native American, pardon me, walks up to these kids and starts banging his drum directly in the face of this poor student whose name was Nick Sandman. It's his real name, Sandman. So what we got from that altercation was a one minute video approximately that was leaked to media, probably by Nathan Phillips people, the uh, native American activist, which apparently showed, or I should say uh, not even apparently showed, cause you could watch it, which showed a smirking teen, this Nick Sandman, or was interpreted as a smirk standing in front of a native American activist as he was getting the drum banged in his face. And you saw a bunch of these, these other white kids surrounding the Native Americans. Now I watched that one minute clip and myself, I said, all right, well, I mean, I'm not rushing to judgment. I'm not going to go tweet about this shit right now. But I just said, oh, okay. That looks like a dick move, but the kid's not assaulting anybody. Even if he has a, a look on his face, which looks like a smirk. And as many of these leftist advocates uh, who, you know, no, no opponents to violence on the left guys said, what a punchable face. Uh, what is his face? Uh, the old Reza Aslan, the old commenter for uh, CNN or MSNBC said, what, have you ever seen a more punchable face? And, you know, I don't even disagree with him necessarily. Can, uh, you know, add one of those faces that you use, maybe, maybe you feel like it was punchable. I'm not saying you should punch it, but you know, maybe, maybe you don't like his look, but I watched this video and to me, it, it does look like these kids are surrounding these Native Americans. And if so, I'm thinking like, oh, okay, that's a dick move, but there's no violence going on. They're not yelling at this, this Native American. It seems like a bunch of kids just kind of acting like jerks. But, you know, they're not maintaining a, a perimeter to, to hold him in or anything. So, of course, everybody goes absolutely apeshit over it. Every media outlet instantly reports that a group of MAGA hat-wearing teens these white racists that were at the March for Life, you know, double double marks against you on the left there for going to a march for a uh, anti-abortion march. So these teens were labeled immediately as racists that were harassing an older Native American man, you know, stepping all over his rights and and uh, making a mockery of his ancient tribal ways by doing the the Indian uh, tomahawk chant that they do in Atlanta Braves Stadium and any number of stadiums across the country. So there were immediately calls for condemnation from these kids, left blue check verified people on Twitter, including, of course, Trump severed head wielding Kathy Griffin calling for these kids to be doxxed, including journalists like a journalist for Vulture, who, by the way, has now been fired by his company. 
always funny to see that come about. And by the way, I'm not necessarily for that. You know, I'm I'm not for anybody being fired for expressing the free speech, but this this guy literally went online and said that he was all for killing the kids and killing their parents. Which you know is a bit of an extreme statement. <laughs> that's that's not a statement I would necessarily make on social media if I was uh in this world and knew that people within a company can easily find those posts. And also that I was a horrible human being for rushing to judgment and deciding that an entire generation of children from a school should be wiped out. But anyway, all these people are calling for these kids to be doxxed, calling for their names, addresses to be uh, rolled out in public, that their parents places of work should be inundated with calls that they be fired because they, how dare they raise such little racists. As of yesterday, Twitter still had USA Today's story about them being horrible racists uh, assaulting this Native American man as the top trending story in U.S. politics. However, as we saw, once there was one of seven videos, I think, revealed uh, or, or released to the public showing that over an hour's time, what actually ended up occurring was quite different. Because over that hour's time, you did see these white kids standing around minding their own damn business until these black Israelites start yelling at them. And then they still maintain their own damn business. They maintained their cool. They did their school chants instead of engaging with these people, instead of acting in violence, instead of trying to intimidate them, do anything like that. They just sat there because they're 17, you know, 16 through 18 year olds unexpected, you know, to get assaulted by verbally by a group of elderly black men with uh, extreme religious views. So they stood their ground and in the middle of this, this fucking asshole. And again, I will maintain, I will, I, I want this man to be labeled as the biggest fucking asshole, this Nathan Phillips, because he's a piece of utter trash. So this piece of garbage walks into the middle of them, walks directly through the throng of kids straight up to this guy, uh, you know, is it Nick uh, Sandman, walks straight up to this kid and starts banging his fucking drum in his face, right next to his face, six inches from his face. Now, if somebody did that to me, I don't know if I would have been as cool and composed as this dude was. And in fact, I think if anything, now that the story's out, and of course, no media have rushed to retract their stories. Like I said, it took a full day for anybody to even have any other headline other than these racist pieces of garbage and this Native American man had a clash. Everybody is so slow. To retract and all these headlines, instead of saying we were wrong, these kids are not racist. This Native American man in, like incited this incident and then released footage specifically catered to make a, a one point of view. Instead of saying that, all these media headlines rolled out reading, "Well, now it paints a fuller picture of the MAGA hat wearing teens and Native American." Of course, the original headline read white MAGA hat wearing teens harass Native American. You know, no qualms about that. There's no, no, no tiptoeing around the issue with that, that headline, right? Of course not. But as we see, this Nathan Phillips, this fucking asshole, was the one that incited this entire thing, manipulated the media, because how easy is it to manipulate the leftist media in this day and age? Simple manipulated the media to get the coverage that he wanted, and then had the audacity to go on and do secondary follow-up interviews, calling these kids beasts, saying that he went in between the white kids and the Israelites to try to calm the situation down because he wanted to get between them and stop the, what he was sure was going to be violence instigated by these white teens. And again, Maybe this son of a bitch didn't realize that everybody has a video camera in their phone now and that, oh, there might be other videos which completely contradict your point and make it very abundantly clear who the dickhead is in this situation. But this piece of shit literally is calling these kids beasts who are going after the prey, which was these four black Israelites who were the ones that were yelling racial slurs, not only at the white kids, by the way. They were also calling Nathan Phillips and his group Uncle Tomahawk and telling them that if they didn't bow down and if they didn't keep, you know, worshiping the eagle and the bear and the buffalo, well, then maybe the white man wouldn't have taken their land away. You know, sweet things that make you want to just cozy up to them. 
But Phillips, he portrays it as though he was having a dialogue with these Israelites and that it was all very respectful and that he had to go defend them from this white mob of beasts. What a sack of human shit this man is. And because of his actions, these kids had death threats. These kids were threatened with expulsion. His kids have been exposed all over now. People, you know, because the thing is, people don't see the secondary retraction. They see the initial rush. I saw even, again, even yesterday, I was still combating people on Twitter about this because they were still still posting things that these were racist, that this is inexcusable, that we have to go after journalists. I had an interaction with a journalist at the New York Times, who, of course, didn't respond to me, but tweeting at her because she said she refused to read an article written at Reason by Robbie Sove, Suave, who I crapped on last week, but I'll give him kudos this week, that exposed this and, and broke it down beat for beat how this is all completely contrived and completely wrong, taken out of context by the media as it was portrayed by Phillips. And this woman, a New York Times journalist who writes a blog on mommy, like being a mother, so you think she'd have some sympathy and compassion for children that are being portrayed as monsters, this bitch won't even read it. She says she will not read the quote-unquote Zuckerberg-style breakdown of the film about these kids because she just has no interest. No interest in the truth? Is what I ask her. You have no interest in seeing a video that completely, completely countermands your position and your opinion on this issue, and you write for the New York Times? You're pathetic. And now we're finally now, finally seeing some coverage the other way. However, even that is still couched in this bullshit language. For example, there's a New York Times piece, which I had sent out to our, our email group, where they finally say, okay, well, you know, we, we might have been wrong. But this woman still says in their New York Times piece, despite seeing the video where Nathan Phillips that fucking asshole walks directly into the crowd of kids who do nothing. Oh, and by the way, little context of the kids smirking too. You can see in the video, first his kid's like, what the fuck's happening? And then he's shocked. And then the people around him are like, should we jump in and like, you know, push this old man out of the way who's beating a drum in our friend's face and who I probably would have punched out personally? If you see that, you can see this kid is trying to smile to kind of reassure him, be like, look, it's okay. This doesn't bother me. Everybody calm down. So again, Sandman is doing the right thing. He is far more calm and composed than I would ever be how any number of you would ever be. So he's doing the right thing. But still, these, this bitch at the New York Times wrote this piece, which I'll link to in the, the show notes, writes a piece that says that the teens encircle Phillips, not Phillips wades into a group untouched and starts aud- you know, uh, let's say audibly in, uh, assaulting Orphonically assaulting a kid by smashing his drum within inches of his face, causing a ruckus. <laughs> and, and it doesn't give the kid any credit for, for doing nothing and not snapping. Nobody, nobody assaults anybody in this entire video. Shocking considering the shit that these people have pulled. So to say, it's, it's one of the most depressing things I've ever witnessed. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm a little down this week. I'm not going to lie to you. Some some shit going on personally uh, that is depressing me. And seeing this was just kind of like the cherry on top. You know, the, it's just the state of American culture, the state of politics, the state of the sickness. I mean, the left is sick. This is repulsive. And now the conservatives jumped on this bandwagon, too, because they bought into this leftist sickness of we must condemn anything immediately that doesn't that doesn't seem completely to jive with whatever cultural norm is is being pushed forward as the agenda. Whatever doesn't jive with the progressive, we have to immediately condemn this without having any idea what we're talking about. So you saw conservatives jump on board and damn these kids. You saw you know conservative senators jump on board and damn these kids. Oh my god, these horrible children are racist. I disavow them. But again, like I was saying earlier, the media response to this is just utterly depressing. And and seeing all the responses from people on the left calling for these kids to be doxxed, to be kicked out, to be murdered, <laughs> which again, Twitter did nothing to remove them. And, you know, Tim Pool, who's an independent reporter who does great work, Tim Pool's been pointing out all the different instances of people literally calling for murder, 
which is against Twitter's rules of conduct. And how many conservatives have been booted off for far, far less? <laughs> Alex Jones, for example. But calling for murder of children, which is ironic, by the way. You know, considering the fact that these kids are at a march for life. And, of course, the progressives want to kill more children. So calling for the murder of children, I get no repercussions. Except this one guy who wrote for Vulture, which I'm so happy to see. So happy to see. But, you know, the mob justice is just insane. Absolutely insane. And it it does make me wonder, you know, the, the cultural civil war we're having here. Because we're seeing... Anything on the cultural forefront, anything that can be used by the left as fodder for these bleeding masses of swine, which go along with this shit, that are just hungry for blood, hungry for anything that can be used against someone they consider as a political opponent. That's what's sickening to me. And that's what I really am terrified of in regards to a forthcoming potential civil war in this country. Because when I see stuff like this, it makes me wonder if we are not too far gone. And I've long said that Americans have too much to lose to actually have a real civil war. But now I don't know. I mean, there's so much vitriol. There's so much invested in being right in this. And you see the mobs. I mean, you see Antifa, the mob mindset of these Antifa fuckers. You see the bloodthirstiness of these online mobs. It does make me wonder if there's not a spark that could set that off. But the funny thing is, Watching the coverage of our American cultural civil war at the expense of covering actual civil wars or actual things that matter. Because in the grand scheme of things, does a group of teens that are wearing Make America Great hats, non-violently having a stare down with an old Native American man in a public space, have jack fucking shit to do? with everyday American life. Does it have anything to do with relations between people on a macro level? Does it have anything to do with our safety and security at home? Or is this simply an example of free speech and engaging in free speech? And not only engaging in free speech, but children engaging in free speech. Oh, and by the way, one more thing I forgot to add. Uh, After the full video had come out, all these shit-eating fuckbags on the left still said that these kids deserve to be doxxed and they were still pieces of garbage because they were MAGA hat wearing white kids at a March for Life rally. And one woman even said that these kids were at a rally making sure that she was a uh, child birthing uh, sow for the masses or something, insinuating that somehow that uh, should this, you know, should people outlaw abortion, which I am not for, by the way, I am, uh, I am pro-choice, but should people outlaw abortion that somehow women will go and be enlisted in a baby making army on a federal level? I, I, it just makes no sense. But, you know, again, God forbid that uh, these children have an opinion where they don't want to kill babies. <laughs> you know, makes them the worst people in the world. So, anyway, we're seeing this, though. We're seeing this cultural civil war get covered. Meanwhile, there's literally a civil war beginning in Venezuela. Over this past weekend, as I said earlier, you had a small military coup attempted. And this was by National Guardsmen. There's only like 25, 30 of them. But they tried to, you know, they took over a police station. They're calling for a violent revolution to occur to overthrow Maduro. And while this is happening, while you've got all these instances at home of rioting, of people opposing the leadership, of people there domestically saying, this is a sham presidency. This man is starving us to death. This man is making our money worth nothing. He's t- you know, I, we can't even have water. We can't even get water. That's military control at this point. And while this is happening, Mike Pence gets word of this, and he says, well, you know what we need to do? We need to support the head of the opposition, the National Assembly, the, Democrat- the democratically elected National Assembly, a guy named Juan Guiado, probably saying that wrong. He's got the real claim to be the president of Venezuela. And in fact, people should rise up and support him, including the OAS, the Organization of American States, Brazil, Chile, and uh, Puerto Rico is also part of that. So basically, you've got this civil war brewing in Venezuela. You've got rioting in the streets. You've got actual military members trying to overthrow Maduro. And you've got on our side a vice president who is rooting for Puerto Rico 
which of course is a U.S. territory, to get involved and support the opposition, to support Guiado. To me, doesn't that distinctly sound like Mike Pence calling for us to get involved in yet another civil war? But unless you really dove deep, you wouldn't know that Mike Pence said this. You wouldn't know that there was a coup that was attempted, a small coup, but still a coup attempted in Venezuela. You wouldn't know any of this because covering Venezuela's civil war and the possible uh, implication of the United States in fighting in that civil war, should Puerto Rico and Chile and Brazil get involved in this, that goes completely unreported because, you know, we got to talk about these MAGA hat kids. We got to, got to talk about our, our American cultural civil war rather than concentrating on socialism being potentially overthrown in a foreign nation. And while I don't think we should have any part in this, America's being involved in it. I, what is going on in the world? The priorities. I mean, God, can, have you ever seen clear priorities in regards to how the media covers things? The, clearly... The left agenda to push forward these progressive ideals is vastly outpaced any interest in stopping our military industrial complex from expanding, from stopping rampant militarism across the United States, or not across the, across the, uh, the worldwide frontier. The left is so concerned with this fucking kid yelling at an old man, or not even, a kid standing in front of an old man who's banging a drum in his face, that they've decided to drop all pretext of being anti-war all pretexts of being anti-imperialism, and apparently all pretexts of coming down against Mike Pence, who you'd think they would hate vastly more than Trump. And in this instance, they'd be right. (laughs) We do need to stand up and say, no, 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 Mike Pence. Uh, U.S. territory should not be getting involved in what's going on in Venezuela. Because just like any attack on Israel is an attack on the United States, I'm sure... Anybody in Puerto Rico who decides to go over there and fight and gets killed in Venezuela is going to be used as a pretext for the United States to send troops over and invade Venezuela. Because Donald Trump's already floated that idea out there, by the way, whether or not we should depose Maduro. And without a doubt, we should not. What business do we have in Venezuela? That situation seems to be working itself out just fine, in my opinion. Now, I weep for the people that have tragically died in Venezuela. I weep for the ongoing deaths in Venezuela. I weep for the economic state that that country is in. But that doesn't mean we should get involved in it. That means that that state is coming to the natural outcome of socialism, which that it does not work, and the people will, in fact, revolt against the government, which is oppressing them economically, socially, culturally, starving them to death, and it will be a violent revolution. And to that end, I say things are going in the right way. And I don't want to see us get involved. I don't need to see Americans going over there and dying so that Venezuelans can have a better way of life. I'm sorry, that's that's not anything that I'd be interested in. But anyway, I doubt we hear much more about that because there's got to be a next outrage around the corner. So we'll just wait until the media decides what that outrage is and what will best forward the leftist social agenda. All right, that about wraps it up, guys. I will uh, see you next week. So from me, Brian McWilliams, from all the Lions of Liberty, who, of course, you can hear three days a week on this OG Variety podcast with Mark Clare interviewing people on Mondays with his in-depth interviews with leaders of the libertarian movement, John Odie Odermatt on Fridays with Felony Friday, very important show, and, of course, me here on Wednesday, yelling and screaming. So anyway, guys, from me, from Lines of Liberty, from Electric Liberty Land, always stay plugged into liberty.